It's October 1st, and we are back with another episode of Crime After Crime, and we're so happy that you're here. Another person I'm happy to have with me is the wonderful and talented Danielle Hallen. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. It's officially spooky season. I say this every year. October is my favorite month. <laughs> she does. She does. I've been here a few years now. She says it every October. I do. I don't let uh, anyone forget. Yeah, and in case you forgot, because I forgot to say it, I'm John Lorden. So there. Okay. <laughs> the world's two best hosts. We forget exactly. to introduce ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I've told this story in a little while, so I'm going to go into it now. When I first met Danielle, uh, I watched many of her videos, but started getting in contact with her. And I called her Danelle because she never introduced herself in her video. <laughs> I know. I'm the worst about it. <laughs> Who does that? I was following in your footsteps on this episode, but thankfully we caught it in time. I still don't do it, though. I still don't ever introduce myself on my channel. And you don't introduce yourself on the podcast. We just like to be mysterious. Yeah, yeah. The the hosts, the mysterious hosts. (laughs) Um, If you would like to meet Danelle or myself, you can come (laughs) out to CrimeCon Las Vegas. But if you were hoping to get into that meetup that we're doing, we're currently booked. We had so many people that jumped on that on the first two call outs. We're, we've currently got it booked out, mm-hmm. but keep listening to every episode. We're trying to work on some ways where we can let maybe one or two more of you in there. Maybe we'll have a little contest of some kind, something along those lines. But of course, if you come out, you can still always meet us at our crime after crime table in podcast row. We'll definitely be there. You get to talk to us, hang out, spend a bunch of time. But if you wanna be at that meetup, don't give up yet. You still might have another chance. And you can still get 10% off your general crime con admission by going to www.crimecon.com and buying your ticket right now using code crime after crime. Then you can come out to Vegas, get ready for plenty of mystery and fun. You might even have to search for us. We might forget to put our names up on our on our on our table. Right. There you go. That's a great idea. It's just gonna be a black hide cloth. and seek. Yeah. You'll see hands at the table, but yep. people that are crouched down behind it. Oh, goodness. It is now time for our results from the last episode. We looked into showbiz crimes. That was a really, really fun Mm -hmm. episode. That was fun. Danielle told the story of a talented con artist who has fooled dozens of people and duped them out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. They were known as the Hollywood con queen. I told the story of the kidnapping of Frank Sinatra Jr. seemingly pulled off with the planning of a bad college prank. How did this play out, Danielle? All right, it played out exactly as I expected. On the website poll, I received 37% of the votes and John received a whopping 63%. On Twitter, on Twitter, it was a little bit closer, just barely, um, with me at 43% and John at 57%. Honestly, I cannot say I'm surprised. I even walked away from that and immediately told the Frank Sinatra story to so many people. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, the that 10 dimes thing. Story. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, yeah. And just uh, what a way to honor the experience that he had gone through yeah. for his son. But I think I was proud of the the notes that we also hit about how media was trying to use that story and the fact that, you know, Frank kind of fought that off and you've still got this guy running around trying to tell mm-hmm. his version of events. But anyway, uh, Danielle, I, I need something to warm my throat here a little bit. Yeah, you got. Uh, oh, what's that? I guess I'll unwillingly hand over my mug to you. Enjoy. Oh, thank you. And it has tea in it. It's perfect. <laughs> oh, man. I'll, I'll take it. That was a good story. I was yeah. I was very proud of your story. And I didn't oh. even tell it. <laughs> no, you, you told a good story, too. And and this, the numbers show it. It's uh, It was by no means a blowout. But today, I want you to come on board. We're expecting you. But it's not for the love boat. We are looking into cruise ship crimes. And it is not all fun and shuffleboard. No, it Since, isn't. no not at all. <laughs> Since 2014, <laughs> it has been mandated that several categories of crimes on cruise ships be reported to the FBI. 
thankfully. Those yeah. categories include tampering with the vessel, assault with bodily injury, theft greater than $10,000, kidnapping, missing U.S. nationals, suspicious death, and homicide. However, the last category is the one that is most troubling because of the numbers associated with it, and that is sexual assault. Yeah, unfortunately, sexual assault is the most common crime reported, with 35 being reported in the summer of 2019. And the data shows that that was an increase over the previous year by more than 50 percent. It really sucks to think that you might not want to go for that extra cocktail on your vacation. But a list of tips on how to stay safe on cruise lines says pretty much exactly that. Watch your alcohol intake, be wary of visiting cabins of strangers, and keep your valuables in your cabin safe. Thankfully, the numbers also show that crimes don't happen very frequently, with 12 to 14 million annual travelers and around 100 to 125 incidents typically reported annually. Your odds of being a victim are somewhere around 1 in 88,000, according to Cruisely.com. Now, did that make it tough for us to find stories for today's episode? I don't think so, but we're going to find out together with uh, a first story from the amazing Danielle Hallen. Okay, so growing up, I actually frequently went on cruises as a summer vacation with my family. My dad always took us. I loved it. I loved to explore the ship on my own. There was a sense of freedom of being able to go to the pool whenever I wanted. I could grab snacks at the complimentary snack bar. It always felt like the world's coolest vacation. And I almost feel like there's this weird false sense of security when you're on a cruise. I always felt like nothing bad could happen on there. Now, this is likely why I now have an absolute fascination with cruise ship crimes. My first video ever on my YouTube channel was the disappearance of Rebecca Corium from a Disney cruise. And I feel like without even knowing it when I was younger, I was kind of walking this dangerous line. I've gone into all these stories that show the nasty side of cruises, why they're known to have basically be the perfect place to commit a crime, how jurisdictions can change from cruise line to cruise line. There's flagged countries that the ships belong to, and those flagged countries can sometimes decide not to investigate. And that's if the scene hasn't already been cleaned up in preparation for the revolving customers. Time is money, investigations take time. Half the time it really feels like there's no rules on the open ocean. All these blurred lines leave most cruise ship crimes unsolved and have given the fun vacation a notorious reputation. And that may be why a well-known California attorney made a cruise a part of his murder plot. Mm. I know, not a good time. No. 62-year-old Lonnie Cacontis didn't seem like he had a bright future growing up. By the time he was in his early 20s, he already had five felonies under his belt and seemed destined for a life of crime. In a surprising turn of events, he somehow ended up in law school, <laughs> of all places, and became a very well-known attorney in L.A. And this is where he met his second wife, 52-year-old Mickey Kanasaki. Now, Mickey Kanasaki had moved to the U.S. when she was just a child, along with her four siblings, and she went on to complete school successfully as well and became a paralegal. And she ended up working in the same office as Lonnie. Mickey and Lonnie fell in love and they eventually, eventually, eventually got married in 1995 and moved into a beautiful home in Ladera Ranch to start their life. But their marriage was far from perfect. This Mickey, she ended up actually having to quit her job as a paralegal. She had really bad arthritis. Obviously, that causes a lot of problems. And this left Lonnie as the main provider in their home. Mickey claimed that because of this, he was very frugal with their money. He never allowed her to buy anything. They couldn't go out and have a good time. So she ended up in her free time taking up investing to try to earn them more. But the relationship still crumbling. Lonnie complained that Mickey, on the other hand, was very aggressive. He said that she drank too much. And it got to the point that police were showing up at their home for domestic violence calls, mainly that Mickey was harming Lonnie. So I think they both came to terms with the fact their relationship wasn't good. And in 2002, they started the process of getting a divorce. But despite this and the clear tension building, they continued to live together. Lonnie was apparently in the middle of a lawsuit, and they did this to ensure that all of their assets were safe. But during this time, quite literally 
Probably within two months, Lonnie ended up meeting another woman named Amy on a dating website and Mickey had no idea. So for the next three years, Lonnie and Mickey continued to live together while Lonnie was having the secret relationship. Hmm. Yeah. Good times, right? Yeah. Just, I mean, you already have all these tensions going Mm -hmm. on. It's like, great. Let's bring this into the fold. Yeah. Let's just add it. Yeah. And by 2005, Lonnie made his way to Las Vegas and he married Amy his third wife, and with that, he finally moved out of the home. But again, despite Lonnie having a new place to live and a new wife, he for some reason could not let go of his old home. But it was more about the money and not so much about the house itself. He repeatedly asked Mickey to sell the house so that they could split the cost, but she refused. She was comfortable there. You know, she was already kind of tiptoeing the dangerous line of not having a job. So in September of 2005, Lonnie filed a lawsuit in an attempt to force her to sell. But this also didn't last long because within two months of being married to Amy, Lonnie divorced her and ended up back on Mickey's doorstep. He never showed up to the lawsuit, so ultimately it was dropped. Now Mickey welcomed him back because he promised he would mend their broken marriage, but As expected, the issues resumed. So Lonnie unexpectedly decided to book a beautiful Mediterranean cruise in hopes that a romantic getaway would fix all of theirs or all of his problems. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. On May 21st, 2006, Lonnie and Mickey hopped on a flight that took them to Spain where they were set to board the cruise ship Island Escape. They had a beautiful room with a nice balcony to enjoy the ocean as they went from location to location. And the first few days went great as expected. And the same with May 25th, 2006. They were having a great day, but it ended in chaos. So that day they went out on an excursion where they they were able to tour Messina, Italy. They had a nice dinner that night before stopping at the casino for a bit. And then they ended the night at a show before heading off to their room for a glass of wine at around 11 p.m. They were so, you're already shaking your head. You're like, this isn't mm-hmm. going, this isn't I, going good places. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. But I mean, what else would you expect? I mean, this is supposed to be a couple that would take care of each other mm-hmm. in situations and, mm-hmm. you know. So they were supposed to go sightseeing in Naples the following day supposed to be a really big day. So Lonnie decided to take an Ambien. He wanted to make sure that he was fully rested, but Mickey complained she was having trouble sleeping. So sometime around midnight, she told Lonnie she was heading up to grab a cup of tea from the ship's restaurant and then would be back down. But at 4.30 a.m., Lonnie woke up and Mickey wasn't back in the room. Mm. So he went out, so he says, to search the ship and alerted the crew to her disappearance. They immediately put out an alert over the loudspeakers and checked to see if anyone had seen Mickey and the restaurant the night before. Authorities in Naples at this point also boarded the ship and spoke with Lonnie, who recanted the same story, and they also joined in the search for Mickey, but they had no luck. Lonnie then explained to authorities that Mickey drank a lot, and he was worried that she may have continued to drink that night. He suggested that she maybe drank enough to make herself sick, and while leaning over the railing of the ship, she might have possibly fallen over. Oh, he just weaved that story. I mean, it's so clunky. Could you imagine trying to relay those details to lead people to that conclusion? In oh, that way? by the by the way, yeah. she may have yeah. <laughs> been nauseous. And did uh, I mention how big her head was and how I top know. heavy she was? I mean, <laughs> easily would have flipped. <laughs> yeah, jeez, wow. I know. Authorities, well, that's what's going to make this even more unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Authorities were able to confirm that Mickey had not been seen by any of the crew members or passengers since she went to bed that night at 11 p.m. with Lonnie. They also confirmed, however, that the neighbors on either side didn't report hearing anything strange that night. When searching their room that they shared, they also found no sign of a struggle. They did see Mickey's luggage, a bottle of wine, two wine glasses. They were able to corroborate Lonnie's story for the most part, but that was it. So at this point, they believed the only likely thing that happened was that Mickey had in fact fallen overboard. But they made it clear that if that was the case, the chances of finding her were slim to none. Naples authorities put Lonnie in a hotel room in town so that he could have somewhere comfortable to stay while they searched for his ex-wife. But in less than 24 hours, on May 27th, Lonnie left Naples 
without saying a word and flew back home. Oh, man. Whoa. But not only did he fly back home, he didn't fly back to the home he shared with Mickey. No. <laughs> he went to Amy's house. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, I my goodness. This, I mean, it's like it was a mission. Like, oh, yeah. oh I've got all these lingering things. I'm going to take care of it, but mm -hmm. I won't be around for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. But that same day, the unexpected happened. What they said would be impossible. The remains of Mickey were found floating off the coast of Italy by a lone random research boat. Wow. wow. This should have been a story from the unlucky criminal episode. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> like 100%. Seriously, the odds of that. I mean, yeah. Wow. A forensic wow. examination was done on June 7th by the Italian chief medical examiner under the careful watch of a U.S. pathologist. And the autopsy didn't show what they believed happened. Mickey didn't accidentally fall overboard. There was no sign of water in her lungs at all. She'd been killed first and then thrown over. Robbery wasn't a motive. She still had all of her jewelry on her. There were no other signs on the ship that showed, you know, struggles. So they had to figure out how this all happened, all while no longer having access to the cruise ship that had just continued on. Right, right. By December of that year, the FBI began to investigate the case, and they immediately looked to Lonnie for very obvious reasons. <laughs> it was strange that he divorced Mickey, married another woman, filed a lawsuit against Mickey, divorced a second wife, ended up back with Mickey, and then almost immediately she ends up dead. Yeah. Lonnie had never left the country before until this cruise, ever. <laughs> and wow. everyone that I know, and everyone that knew him said he was not known to take vacations, period, because he was so frugal. He did not want to pay for them. So something was fishy. The cruise itself was also a very interesting choice. Lonnie was the first American ever to book this cruise line because the cruise line did not market to the United States. It was a cheap European cruise meant for the lower working class to be able to take a vacation. It was nothing at all like big name cruises like the Carnival, Royal Caribbean. It was literally a freight ship that had been remodeled. <laughs> what? It's very ugly. I'm just going to be honest. Oh, my God. Like if I were to pick a cruise, that, that would not be the one I would pick. And apart from being a cheap cruise not on the U.S. radar, it was also a ship that conveniently didn't have security cameras because of its low budget mm. and their room with a nice balcony. That was one of just a few handful of rooms that he very specifically stated that he wanted when booking. The balconies were welded onto the side with no other balconies underneath of them, creating a straight drop to the ocean. Wow. Wow. Now, to make things even more eerie, the ship wasn't always a European one. Decades earlier, it once went by the name of the Star Dancer out of Long Beach. And ironically, when it was under that name, it was booked by a man named Scott Rostin, a well-known chiropractor. He took his wife on the cruise as a honeymoon trip to Mexico, but before making it there, he killed her and threw her overboard. But just like Mickey, she ended up being found near San Diego, and Scott was charged with murder. Did, Scott didn't <clears throat> know Lonnie, did he? Lonnie didn't have any communication because I almost felt nope. like the way this was going that like, did this guy read this somewhere? Like the planning on this is just kind of next level. Like, oh, yeah, he had to have read about this or or yeah, read about the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just said, you know, oh, well, the odds of her being found are so low. If that didn't happen, this probably would have been perfect. Mm -hmm. And then track down the boat. Oh, mm -hmm. goodness. And then the real icing on the cake is that just before the cruise, Lonnie suggested that they rewrite their will. If Lonnie died, Mickey would get everything. And if Mickey died, Lonnie would get everything. He was the beneficiary of several of their bank accounts, including her investments. And what he'd been just dying for, he'd get their house. Mm. And when she died, he did in fact collect over $1 million, but yep. police couldn't prove anything. Meanwhile, Lonnie's back at home. He left Amy again and moved all the way across the country to Safety Harbor, Florida. 
In 2008, authorities were desperate to find a way to get Lonnie in their hands, and they saw their chance when he, clearly in some sort of weird panic, transferred the $1 million he got from Mickey's death to various foreign bank accounts that he held with his now fourth wife, a new one. I know, he just is on a roll. Yeah. And then shortly after he did this, he then for some reason moved it all back to U.S. accounts. So Lonnie was accused of basically benefiting from Mickey's murder financially. The FBI began to investigate the money transfers as illegal activity, and they ultimately seized all of the money from Lonnie's bank accounts and filed a civil asset forfeiture case. But this still wasn't murder charges. However, after asking around, they were able to put together a pretty strong case. So Amy, his third wife, that poor woman that had just been <laughs> put through the ringer, yeah. um, she had actually testified in favor of Lonnie to a federal judge when the civil forfeiture case came up. And she basically claimed he would never hurt anybody. You know, Lonnie's not like that. He came home devastated. But now in 2013, she said she wanted to change her statement. Mm -hmm. Amy said the only reason she made that statement was out of fear. Lonnie told her when he left her that he didn't actually want to, but he had to. He said that he planned to go back to Mickey and take her on a cruise and kill her. He told Amy that he planned to use a good friend of his and unfortunately a PI <laughs> named Bill Price to find a contract killer for him. Bill and his girlfriend would then go on the cruise with them to witness everything so that Lonnie would basically have an alibi. I mean, they thought this through. Yeah, yeah. The last minute, Bill backed out. So Lonnie said he was taking matters into his own hands. When she first testified for Lonnie, he allegedly threatened to kill her if she didn't, said that he would make it look like an accident, just like Mickey, or make it look like Amy was involved in Mickey's murder. So obviously out of fear, she testified the way he wanted her to. But with this new information, on February 13th, 2013, Lonnie was formally charged with murder and arrested in a parking lot in Florida on February 15th. Now, Orange County prosecutors back in California, California claim that they had jurisdiction because intent was found and the facts that Lonnie planned the trip in Orange County, he bought tickets for the trip in Orange County, and he left with Mickey in Orange County. Okay. okay. But Lonnie's lawyer said, they didn't have any jurisdiction because Mickey died in Italy. Yeah, it's it's <clears throat> weird. I was looking into jurisdictional stuff yeah. also, and it's like the um, the if they're at a port, whatever country that they're at, mm -hmm. like that's the jurisdiction that kind of takes mm -hmm. over. But as soon as they're a number of miles away out in the ocean, it's supposed to revert back to the home. Yeah, port. like the flagged country right. for the ship yeah. for the ship but um it's making a good point because elements of the crime like even if you couldn't put the murder charge on him mm -hmm. there's kind of like the the conspiracy and the fraud elements yeah. that are certainly happening in the u.s um and then yeah that's that's interesting to think of how that could come along with those charges well unfortunately the judge agreed that there was no jurisdiction in orange county yeah but, for, for the murder yeah Prosecutors had a backup plan. They weren't letting this go. Yeah. So they again charged him with murder, but this time with special circumstances of financial gain. There we go. Yeah. And this worked. Yeah. So Lonnie sat in jail awaiting his trial while his lawyers again tried to keep saying Orange County had no jurisdiction. I mean, this was like years long of a battle. Right. And with all that time to sit, Lonnie came up with another heinous plan. So Lonnie found out that Amy was talking. So he tried to hire two inmates to take her out so that she couldn't testify against him. How many times are we going to say this on this show? I'm what, telling you. What is it? Like as soon as people get in, in prison, they think like, oh, I'm going to talk to my cellmate. And yeah, he's going to mm -hmm. take care of it for me. It's This happens time and time again. Oh, yeah. So the plan was basically he was going to write a letter for Amy to sign that stated that she stood by her original testimony. And the only reason she came to authorities in 2013 was because authorities basically threatened her because of how badly they wanted to charge him. And then once she signed this, she would be killed. Wow. And Lonnie's thinking, oh, this is a beautiful plan. 
He's already thinking, there's no way they're getting me for the murder of Mickey. I'll just do this too. We're just going to, he feels like he's untouchable at this point, but he wasn't because the inmates immediately went to a lawyer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So his plan was immediately stopped and he tacked on some more charges. One charge of bribing a witness and two charges of solicitation of murder were added. So he's just piling them on. Lonnie finally went to trial in February of 2020 for the murder of Mickey. Even then it was delayed a bit because COVID hit literally Right. right when the trial started. But by June 15th of 2020, he was found guilty. 14 years after Mickey had been killed. It took 14 years to prove that Lonnie killed Mickey because of jurisdiction issues, because of lack of access to the boat, lack of surveillance on the boat, and the list literally goes on and on and on. On September 18th, 2020, Lonnie was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. Because of the sentencing, they did decide to drop the solicitation of murder charges because, yeah, I mean, they, they got what they wanted. Yeah, exactly. He's behind bars. And experts testified at the trial that basically said had Mickey's body not been found by a crazy chance, like literally, usually people are not found. Yeah, yeah. We're not even talking needle in a haystack. Like the odds yeah. are way, I mean, that's, that's. Yeah, it's insane. It they is. they never would have known that she had been killed instead of this all being some tragic accident. Lonnie now they literally would have gotten away with like the perfect murder. They didn't identify cause of death though, right? They just identified that she had likely died before entering the water. So they were able to say that she had likely died from blunt force trauma or strangulation. Okay. Um, The blunt force trauma, they said, was likely from like a convex, like the the wine bottle, basically. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, but it took like a whole lot. I mean, think about it. They thought it was an accident. So many things because it was deemed that and there was nothing to prove otherwise at first. Stuff wasn't kept as evidence. I mean... You've got this cruise that's cleaned up immediately afterwards, set off to sail again. I mean, had her body not been found, they never would have pushed this further. They never would have known the difference. And that wine bottle, it was the wine bottle. And I will officially never go on a cruise again. That's it? Yeah. Not just with a person named Lonnie, just in general? You're done? Never again. I mean, they were talking about how insane. Like, they even when they compiled all this evidence and had these people coming forward, Bill Price came forward. He was like, look, this is all the information I have. He was like, he he testified against Lonnie, who was his best friend. They had all of this, and still people were like, no one had, we don't know who has jurisdiction. Yeah. I mean, it's so scary to think that, There's already this crazy chance that if you're thrown overboard after being killed on a cruise that no one's going to know you were actually killed. But then to know even if your body is found and it proves you were killed that no one knows how to press charges like it's just who that one sent me for a ride. Yeah. I mean, there's all there's all the legal knots that that case had to go through. And one of the things that kind of freaked me out when I was looking into these stories, too, is you can find these kind of smaller independent publications Mm -hmm. that are all kind of echoing the same thing of these cruise companies are so good at covering up what's actually happening Mm -hmm. that even the stuff that we're getting reported to the FBI is probably, you know, pretty, pretty undercut in terms of what's actually happening out there. Well, yeah, because I mean, if you think about it, how expenses are, how expensive are cruises and you've got how many passengers on them? I mean, these are huge money making, I mean, just raking it in. And the thought of having to dry dock a ship and investigate the ship for oh. who knows how long. Not going to happen. Uh, it's yeah. never going to happen. They're not going to let that happen. Yeah. And, and also because of, you're right, because of the amount of money that's mm-hmm. going into those organizations. And then mm-hmm. those organizations are giant corporations. Some of them have big names. Looking mm-hmm. at you with the funny ears. I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Wow. Well, there's one element I really like about this story, and it's really that Lonnie kind of screws himself, Mm -hmm. like, you know, moving the money screwed him, him trying to take care of this problem from behind bars screwed him over. Um, 
I just I'm glad he's not a mastermind criminal and and actually got away with this. You know, I know because it's close. I mean, if you think about his history, he was a criminal before he became a lawyer. Like he's always had his foot in the door of that. And he obviously was good at it. And becoming an attorney probably only made it worse. (laughs) It's just sad though. Like, you know, you're so smart and you could be dedicated in that kind of way. Like turn that to good, do something good for people. people. Just don't do that though. And it's so, it's frustrating to watch. Yeah, definitely. Well, that was, that was a deep one, Danielle. Thanks for, uh, Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I've got mine queued up, ready to go. Can I take on Danielle's story? We're going to find out right after this short break. You don't have to be on a fancy cruise to have world-class meals. You just need HelloFresh. They get rid of the stressful meal planning and their no-contact delivery brings a box direct to your stateroom or your home with everything needed to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. With more than 50 menu and market items, there's something for everyone to enjoy. You can also stay swimsuit ready with their calorie smart, carb smart, vegetarian and pescatarian meal options. Four out of five customers say HelloFresh helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. My personal favorite meal is the hearty black bean and poblano soup. It comes with blue corn tortilla chips. Shout out to HelloFresh. If you want to send me a bulk supply, I will absolutely accept it. The fall harvest is officially on with HelloFresh. Enjoy seasonal excursions like pumpkin cinnamon rolls and high quality ingredients that travel from the farm to your front door in less than a week. Helm your culinary voyage using the quick and easy HelloFresh app. Skip a week, pick alternate recipe options, whatever you want to do, it's all there and more. And no packing or passport needed. Embark on a week full of great meals whenever you choose. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. They are Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company of 2021. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Try America's number one meal kit right now. All right, you guys, welcome back. I am so looking forward to hearing John's story because I am telling you, I'm so fascinated in cruise ship crimes. And I am. I am too. And I, you know, uh, I really can't do a cruise ship. Like I get, I get yeah. seasick just. Oh in, man. If I'm in a boat, in a, in a pool in someone's backyard, it's, it's, I'm already done. Um, but looking into this world, looking into mm-hmm. some of the challenges around like the legalities that you had brought up, um, some of the stuff about the corporate structures and kind of those stories being tidied away, the aspect of thinking of a crime scene that just literally gets wiped out time and time again as that thing keeps going and then traveling across the world. Um, it was certainly an interesting research. Plus, this is probably one of the longest research um, times that I've done for a story. Yeah, me too because of one particular type of media in this research, which I'll I'll circle back on at the end. But uh, this is a story I like to call Sugar Daddy, but sugar (laughs) is in quotes. Uh Uh-oh, oh Oh, no. (laughs) Danielle, imagine this. I wanna send you on a cruise, Mm -hmm. not a three day or even a seven day. I wanna send you on a cruise for a few months. And all you have to do is see the world, spend someone else's money, take photos, post them on Instagram, and try mm-hmm. to get likes. You okay. start in, sound good so far? <laughs> I'm like, perfect, sign me yeah, up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like it was made for you. You start in England, you end in Western Australia after 68 days of seeing the best vacation spots in the world. There's just one little tiny catch, but so far you're in, right? Yes. Excellent. It sounds like a dream. I didn't even know they made cruises that lasted that long. I didn't either. We're going to hear all about it. This was the situation faced by 22-year-old Melina Roberge. She once posted on Facebook, life is a gift. If you get a chance, take it. If it changes your life, then let it. Because if you never get lost, then you'll never get found. And in a way, this is a story about her getting found. According to her Facebook profile, the college dropout worked at a jewelry store called Pandora in Montreal, Canada, and wanted to enjoy the finer things in life. Luckily, a man she refers to as her sugar daddy 
whom she won't identify, told her that someone else was scheduled to go on this cruise of a lifetime in the summer of 2016, but they had to cancel. So he was giving her the $20,000 cruise ticket, as well as several thousand dollars for spending money. When her father asked, who's paying this $22,000 for this holiday? She didn't answer him directly. He cautioned her about the trip, but Melina was ready to sample the high life. The trip was taking place aboard the Sea Princess, a ship 857 feet long by 188 feet high that can transport 2001, uh, 2016 passengers and 910 crew members and all of the food, booze, and fun needed for a dream vacation on top of it. With 15 decks, three swimming pools, several bars and restaurants, six spas, a casino, and even an onboard movie theater, Melina was going to have plenty to do to keep her busy while they stopped at dreamy locations all across the world. On top of that, she was sharing cabin 312 with her friend, another Canadian woman who was 28 years old named Isabel Lagasse. Isabel worked at a bar near Montreal, and as the trip came up, didn't tell anyone at work where she was going or that she was leaving at all. Just kind of like up and left. <laughs> Bye. See ya. Yeah. Sugar Daddy told Melina all they had to do was enjoy themselves, post a ton of pictures on Instagram, and try to get as many likes as possible. The crews departed on July 9th from Southampton, England, with the two young ladies on board, and they did as they were were instructed, both of their Instagram accounts highlighting their activities. On July 11th, they posted a pic of them enjoying an Irish coffee at a seaport in Ireland. By July 20th, they were posing in Times Square, New York. July 23rd, Melina posted a pic showing her taking advantage of the sun and beautiful weather in Bermuda. A week later, they're frolicking in Ecuador. A pic from August 3rd shows Melina having the time of her life on an ATV in Lima, Peru. August 11th, she's in Chile. August 17th, Isabel tastes a coconut while standing in the sea. And another pic shows Molina getting a tattoo in Tahiti. Their escapades all documented online with the hashtag World Cruise 2016. The experience seemed to give Molina a new outlook on life. She posted, traveling is one thing, but traveling with an open mind, ready to taste everything, see everything, learn everything, and... Get yourself out of your comfort zone is probably the best therapy and lesson ever. They even learned how to deal with online haters. One post read, if I offend you, cry me a river. I'll bring snacks and a raft. I will literally float down your tears, eating chips and working on my tan. <laughs> she needs to become a YouTuber. She handled it gloriously. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want me to copy paste that? And you can start using that and just paste it yeah. in a response I'm to gonna people. I'm going to start using that. Yeah, cry me a cry river. Cry me a river. I'll, I'll bring, bring snacks and a raft. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. I'm not going to lie. It is pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, Danielle, you're still on board, right? You're ready to sign up for this trip. I've, I've got the ticket. I'm going to send it. I honestly, if I'm being real honest, I absolutely would, because it's actually also kind of fascinating to me that they're able to go to like these luxurious tropical locations, but they're also going to like New York City and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like a good balance of like tropical sightseeing and other places that, you know, it's just kind of fun to go and walk around like New York. I'm here it, for it. It is. It's like seeing the best of the, the mm -hmm. world, like yeah. on this 68 days. But, oh, that's right. There's that one little small detail I forgot to mention before. Uh, you see... The girls hit a little stumbling block on day 51 of their 68-day journey. The Sea Princess docked in Sydney, Australia on August 29th. No doubt Melina and Isabel were ready to take themselves and their Instagram followers on some big adventures in the land down under, but their cabin had a few special visitors, one of them being a dog. Uh-oh. A narcotics dog. I was about to say, I feel like this isn't like a therapy dog or, you know, like. No, no. We'll call him, uh, we'll call him Scooby. So. Okay. <laughs> Scooby seems to really like Isabel's suitcase. And for good reason. They found 35 kilograms or 77 pounds, pounds, Danielle, <sighs> of booger sugar 
That's that, great. That's right. The big C, cocaine. But Scooby wasn't done there. He wanted to visit another cabin. 63-year-old Andre Tamin was a loner with no real family ties. He lived in a suburb of Montreal close to where the girls lived. He had a tiny apartment and earlier that year had closed down a business he had run that was involved in building maintenance. How could he afford a vacation like this? And why did Scooby like several of his suitcases? When three of them were opened, an additional 60 kilograms or 132 pounds of cocaine was found. Three passengers in two separate cabins transporting a total of over 200 pounds of cocaine. Was this all a crazy coincidence? Investigators would later learn that Isabel and Mr. Tamin's tickets were actually booked together. However, he's not known by either of the women's families. Australian authorities said that they believed it was the work of an organized crime syndicate attempting to supply large amounts of cocaine to the Australian community. The value of the cocaine was estimated to be over $20 million. Oh my goodness, John. <laughs> that's kind of like more than just like, you know, like small, small little. Oh yeah. No, that's not personal use. Yeah. That's, no. that's <laughs> commercial transport. Uh, yeah. $20 million all packed into four suitcases in these two cabins. Now, Australia has some of the highest prices in the world for cocaine. It's up to five times more expensive there than it is in Canada. Because of that, seizures of the drug at the border have just been spiking like crazy mm -hmm. over recent years. Now, while Scooby certainly earned his milk bones that day, mm -hmm. he may have had a little help. The Australian Border Force thanked the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Canada Border Agency for tipping them off to three high-risk passengers out of the 1,800 people that were on board. Really? Yeah. They How tipped did them they... I'm wondering about that. I don't know. Like, did they profile them and see they're like, you know, like, how are these people taking this yeah, kind of trip? Yeah, how are they doing this? Exactly. I don't know. I don't know. Um, or was it something on the social media front? You've got these two, you know, young 20-somethings mm -hmm. uh, on Instagram left and right. And I don't know. I just, I don't know how they, they pieced it together. But it's a good thing they did. It was yeah. the biggest seizure of narcotics being carried on a commercial cruise or airliner in Australian history. Now, the Australian Border Force, they wanted to get their social media likes as well. On Facebook, the agency joked that the three did not have much room for clean underwear or spare toothbrushes. And that's a long trip. <laughs> that's a long trip. I'm very concerned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hashtag. Our bags are full of cocaine. <laughs> I know. Forget <laughs> underwear. We've got cocaine. We've got, who we've needs got underwear? <laughs> uh, the three were taken into custody and investigators got further to work. That's when some very interesting information about the girls came out. Isabel was a full frontal porn model being featured on galleries on a website called Flashy Babes. According to Isabel... She was also in some serious financial and possibly physical trouble. She claimed uh -huh. that she had borrowed $20,000 from unnamed people and began to receive threats and then was given an ultimatum. $20,000 for what? I, I, uh, you know, maybe she has a, a, a drug problem yeah. uh, or just, I don't know, making money problem. I've heard two different making things. Making money either. problem. <laughs> well, I've heard she worked at a bar. That. Yeah. <laughs> I heard she worked at a bar. I heard she might have worked at a cafe. Maybe she had expensive tastes too. I don't. I don't know. Hi, I'm having making money problems. Yeah, yeah that's. A, I have a T-shirt. You don't have a T-shirt that says that. I'm using that forever. I'm having making money problems. Uh, yeah. So she's saying that there was an ultimatum. Honestly, a judge kind of pressed around this and felt like there was no real aspect mm -hmm. to that story. Yeah. But. Um, if she was successful in pulling this off, she was supposed to make $100,000, which would easily have paid off her debt if it was real, and mm -hmm. sent her home with a nice stack of cash on top of it. She says that during the cruise, she had to hand off her largest suitcase to another passenger, someone else on the boat. Uh -oh. That person brought it back to her quite a bit heavier, 
And as long as she made it through customs in Australia, they were all set. She was done. She was going to get paid. But mm -hmm. obviously that didn't happen. She wound up behind bars instead. Quote, it pains me to know that my defining years of womanhood will be spent in prison halfway around the world. I feel remorse and anger at myself for being involved with people that are part of a dirty, filthy drug trade. Now, Isabel did receive some leniency for giving an early guilty plea. She was sentenced to seven years yeah. and six months in jail. She became eligible for parole after four years and six months, meaning she was released just this past February. And she was literally like within days kicked right out of Australia. They were like, okay, you're free now. Oh man. Get out. All right, bye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but considering that Isabel's suitcase was the one used and her ticket was booked with Andre Tamin's ticket, uh, was Melina really a part of this? Her fingerprints mm -hmm. weren't found on any of the suitcases or any of the drugs. She proclaimed her innocence and had her trial scheduled for later, but investigators kept working, kept digging. Melina's former boyfriend had a lot to say about her. He said she was a, and this is all a quote from here on, superficial mm -hmm. woman, always turned on by money and on the lookout for a sugar daddy. She was dating older men too because they had the cars and the power to give her the lifestyle she wanted badly. She just wanted the best things, but as far as I knew, she never worked for them. She would go clubbing and I know she was dating other guys. We went out for a month and then she just disappeared. We hooked up again two years ago, but we had moved on. She was still into having it all and having it now. She was into champagne and parties. She just never stopped. Mm. But it was a text message chain between that boyfriend and her that made it pretty hard to deny that she knew what was going on. In the chain, they were having an argument and he replied, quote, we fight all the time because of your effing drug trip. She texted back, basically saying, uh, I can't believe you mentioned my cocaine smuggling Instagram cruise in a text message. <laughs> How dare you bring up this very intricate, you know, thought out plan that I went on this cruise trip with, you know, bucket loads of cocaine. How dare you? Yeah, don't put that in a text. No. Ah, uh, so uh, she, after this was discovered, she quickly changed her tune and opened up about how it all went down. Melina still kept the identity hidden for her sugar daddy, mm -hmm. but mentioned that she was recruited by him to be an escort in Morocco. She made up to $16,000 in one week there in May of 2016. He would line up the dates for her with strange men in nightclubs. Uh, which she said sometimes was just going out to dinner or her receiving gifts from them, but mm -hmm. sometimes did include intimacy. Yeah. After doing that, she says a friend of her sugar daddy approached her about being a decoy for the, for the drug smuggling caper. Oh, interesting. Okay, so yeah. that's how she comes in. Yeah. Uh, she was literally told to take pictures for Instagram and receive likes. She was also... Uh, she also looked to make $100,000 on the deal as well, mm -hmm. but she didn't know how much it was going to be. She thought it was going to be a way smaller quantity than they wound up with. Uh, yeah, that's quite a lot of cocaine. Yeah. Uh, quote, I was meant to be there and look like I was on vacation and look like a cover for everyone else. They said it was two females together who were looking to be on vacation. Now, she believes that the cocaine actually didn't start with them when they started in England, mm -hmm. uh, but it came on board when they were stopped in Peru. Ooh. And okay. here we hear that apparently it's not just the three of them. There was the three of them, but there was also four additional men that took multiple trips ashore and kind of came back to the rooms over and over and over. So in all, it looks like it was more like a seven person operation, but. And they had no idea these other people were on board. Uh, well, it's weird because I, can, I can't find anything about yeah. anyone else being named outside of these three people. I'm not finding any other charges, but I know they know the guy's room numbers. So hmm. they clearly identified them, but because they probably weren't carrying any themselves, I don't Couldn't know if the really. charges were just so small that they were like an accessory to drug transport or something that they just dropped it. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, the three basically take the fall. And from what I can see, the other yeah. four just, just kind of get away with it. 
Um, so the judge, Judge Trail, commented, she was seduced by lifestyle and the opportunity to post glamorous Instagram photos from around the world. She wanted to be the envy of others. I doubt she is now. Nope. It, it's a very sad indictment on her relative age group in society to seem to get self-worth relative to posts on Instagram. It's sad they seek to attain such a vacuous existence where how many likes they receive are their currency. This highlights the negative influence of social media on young women. Melina did make an apology to the court saying uh, that since she's been in jail, I've come across people struggling with addiction. I don't mm -hmm. want to be any part of that. I'm glad she at least learned that lesson out of it. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, if they're younger and naive and they're just trying to benefit themselves, you know, they I don't think they really fully understood their actions and how that was going to go on and affect other people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it all of them, uh, we're going to see where we get a quote from Isabel too. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, we get quotes from all of them and they're all kind of echoing the same thing. Like, wow, I just can't yeah. believe I was led by someone else and I let myself be used in this way effectively. But uh, Melina received a longer maximum sentence and longer period before she could be paroled than Isabel did. Uh, Melina got eight years with parole eligibility starting after four years and nine months, so three months longer than Isabel. Uh, mm -hmm. She was finally released in May of this year as well. Both of the women have not done any interviews since being released, and their Instagram accounts have long been shut down. Um, Andre yeah. Tamin also faced charges and wound up pleading guilty. He was supposed to receive 158000 for his work. Of course, he was carrying more, it seems like. Instead, he is eligible for parole after serving five years and seven months, and that will be in March of 2022. Why the longer sentence? It's said that he wasn't only a courier, that he had more of a role in the operation. And from what I can gather, he was one of the men that was also going on the trips off the yeah, shore, yeah. probably conducting something around the purchases as well. Um so he's got a little time still left in jail, but he also did write a letter apologizing to the court. I stupidly did as others told me to do rather than stand up for myself. Oh, man. Now, of course, media went to town on this story. The ladies were, for, were if I could say it, the ladies were referred to as the cocaine babes and the cocaine cuties. Rolling Yikes. Stone's article was titled meet the worst cocaine smugglers of all time a lot of people get really hung up on the fact that uh they're essentially documenting their whole journey while they're going through this cocaine smuggling operation yeah really yeah uh maxim would say if you're going to get popped you might as well look great doing it but of course that's true yeah, yeah. might as well yeah and it is maxim <laughs> Thank you, news.com.au, CBS News, The Sun, BBC, 9news.com.au, Vice, Rolling Stone, People, The Toronto Sun, and Daily Mail for information contributing to today's story and for saving some of the photos from the now closed Instagram accounts of Melina and Isabel. Are Danielle, you serious? Remember I told you this research took a long time? It took me days to get through those pictures and to get through them again and to get through them again oh man <laughs> there's some nice photos let me just say it's uh, it looks like they were having a very good time man but that's what sucks the most about this entire story is that i feel like they were so i mean i know they were already making questionable decisions on their own but i feel like they were so preyed on they could have like taken a few years and grown up a little it bit does. and done better for themselves and to know that they got roped in with this idea of I can show this off and, you know, not just a great experience, but like they can really show this off and make a good bit of money off of it. And yeah, yeah. A 22 year old and a 28 yeah. year old and, and the 63 year old, a guy that well, has no yeah. family shut down his business might've been down on his luck as well. Looking it's to take a risk on, like this. Yeah. It's just preying on people that really are not in a good spot. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like that. Well, and I'm also wondering about, was this kind of engineered to happen this way as an approach for at least one of them getting through customs? That, yeah, absolutely. Okay, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. let's send the two girls, and we're we we're kind of placing mm-hmm. our bets here. We think they're probably going to get busted, and we're going to maybe try to entice that a little bit by telling them, "Hey, be on Instagram a lot, take a lot of photos." Do maybe they were supposed to be kind of an intended target, and then that way, to mean would kind of just breeze through. He's a sixty-three year old. He's not there. Exactly. You know, no one's going to question those other guys that are leaving the ship. Their names weren't even anywhere. So I, yeah. I feel like they were just bait they were just lied to and thrown in there and if they got through then hey they got through and we got we got a little Mm -hmm. more through but we're really banking on you know to mean getting through not to mention on a cruise of that nature do you think you're going to see many 20 year olds or do you think you're going to see a lot of people that are older exactly which i even found references here Mm -hmm. the girls actually picked up on who the other guys were that weren't supposed to be on the boat because they were so young and then mm. when they introduce themselves to him, they're like, hey, are you part of this? Oh, yeah, you're part of this, too. Let's start having breakfast together. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well. Yeah. I mean, they were definitely just wearing red flags. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and on top of that, um, there was also another person that was supposed to be in Tamin's cabin with him. Mm-hmm. They, st- they started the journey. And when the boat got to Nova Scotia, uh, they bailed. So I don't know if they, yeah, I don't know if they just got cold feet or what, um, but they took off. Also, the way they tried to hide Mm -hmm. the Coke was laughable. Like you literally open the suitcase and there's like a towel laying on top of it. (laughs) Wow. Lift up the towel. You fooled me. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I also just wanted to point out, I just think this whole aspect, I think the judge makes a good point. This, you know, chasing chasing likes is so disgusting but yep. i did want to mention to everyone out there to subscribe to my youtube and follow me on twitter thank you, <laughs> thank you. shameless shout out real quick <laughs> it's not everything but like it's also important there you go subscribing is one thing like is another I mean, it's yeah fun. well it, this this story is intriguing to me as well because i was thinking the whole time i'm like there's no way they had all of that in their suitcase in Canada, got themselves to England. You know, like, how did all of this play out? Right. And they did. They certainly used the advantage of a cruise, which is, I mean, you're jumping on the ocean from port to port, slowly bring things in when they're not at their, you know, highest. Yeah. You know, because you have like the check when you get on a cruise, usually like you go through customs before you get on. Yeah. And like, then they clearly you. And from that point, it's just like a quick security check. Right. To come back on the ship. Well, I mean, think they about, to- totally took advantage of the way cruises work. Just think of the, the, the engineering around this to think mm-hmm. of all the locations that you're stopping at. And then you just kind of run that out as a list yep. and say, where is the place where we can buy it the cheapest? And where's the place where we can sell it for the most? Mm-hmm. Those are our two main points that we're dealing with. And yep. hey, let's run um, let's run kind of a split play. We'll have two teams that are trying to, to get across the finish line and see yeah. if one of them can make it. Um, yeah, pretty crazy. Interesting. Only on a cruise ship. Only on a cruise ship. Speaking of, it's time for extra stories. A few things that we looked into that weren't quite big enough for the main story, but stuff we thought you'd still want to hear about. Uh, I'm going to start it. And this is one, um, I was kind of conflicted because it involves uh, the death of a couple. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's such an important aspect to it that I I just really wanted to talk to you about. So uh, in 2016, Dr. Larry and his wife, Dr. Christy Hammer, were retirees on a 31 passenger cruise in the Peruvian Amazon, and they needed an extra power strip for their cabin. The power strip that they were provided by the staff Mm -hmm. short circuited Mm -hmm. and started a fire. Now grunge.com reports that the cabin wasn't fire resistant There was no firefighting equipment nearby. Only half the emergency crew tried to help, and the half that tried to help weren't trained or certified to even fight fires in the first place. And even the fire alarm never sounded. They didn't have a chance, and the 70-year-old couple didn't make it. Now, that's all terrible, and I think there's some criminal aspects Mm -hmm. you could see in some of that, but the real atrocity in this whole thing The Peruvian Navy did an investigation. They found gross negligence on the part of the crew. And when the children of Larry and Christy Hammer decided to seek compensation, they learned about the 1920 Death on the High Seas Act. According to that law, 
Cruise lines only have to pay families if the dead were responsible for earning money and supporting the family. Because the doctors were retired, it doesn't apply to them. You're joking. No. So they could never seek damages, never get additional compensation. The company, in kind of almost what I consider a jerk move, decided to send a check to refund the cost of the trip to the family. Oh, I would have taken it, walked myself directly to like the highest person I could and lit it on fire in yeah. front of them. But like, that's, yeah. essentially, that's essentially what they did. They returned it. They returned it. They didn't cash it. And I think uh, not just outside of the statement that that makes of you take your money and stick it. Uh, I think legally that is probably the better maneuver as well, because uh, sometimes checks can be seen as a contract as well. Yeah. And if they would have signed yeah. that, there might have been some aspect later of them coming so, well, up we and did saying, reimburse. Like we did yeah, compensate yeah, we, you a little bit. We gave them money and yeah. they accepted it. Their signatures on this. Uh, so yeah, I just I had to tell you about that one. I just I can't believe that the 1920 what? Death on the High Seas Act. And what difference does it? I mean, think of of a retiree, greedy. just greedy. It is, but mm -hmm. think of who. First of all, who takes these cruises? Exactly, and that's exactly why it was made. Yeah, and on top of that, I mean, the reality is a retiree can still be earning money and supporting their family. Mm -hmm. They're just doing it with investments or with things that they've saved along the way. Like it's just, it's, it's slimy. That is so. I was about to say that feels like the grossest, slimiest thing ever. Yeah, it's just slimy. Well, I'm here to add a little bit of ease to that conversation with a brawl <laughs> oh well that that'll work <laughs> that changes things up a little bit <laughs> yeah we're gonna shift gears <laughs> so in 2017 the carnival legend heading for melbourne australia had to make an emergency pit stop in new south wales what was supposed to be a fun vacation somehow turned into a multi-family brawl across half the ship so according to witnesses, one family had been causing issues pretty much from the second they stepped foot on the boat. They were instigating fights, causing all these problems. And finally, the tension on the ship exploded a few days in. The problematic family and other vacationers were pretty much over their crap and they came head to head. A massive fight broke out from what my understanding was actually over a flip flop. What? Yes. Uh, Did someone throw it? it was it a thrown flip flop? Someone stepped on flip flop. Oh, oh, well, don't let that happen. Absolutely not. Now, a massive fight broke out. Dozens and dozens of people involved. I think it started on the pool deck, made its way inside. And security, because by the way, police are not on these ships. Mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. like no one jurist, you know, there's no one who do they put out there? It's literally just security guards. Yeah. And they came to help stop, but they actually just made the fight worse because of how horribly underprepared they were. I'm talking teenagers were being hit like little 15, 14 year old kids were being knocked in the face. You've got entire families wrestling on the floor. Security started using their handcuffs as knuckle dusters. They were wielding broken bottles as weapons. Whoa. They ended up calling in mechanics from below the ship because those are some like big burly guys to yeah. help. And they basically just also joined the fight. You, I mean, there's a video of it. You see security guards kicking people on the ground. I mean, people are pulling each other's hair. You see this one guy wind back on a woman. I mean, it was an absolute nightmare. There was no stopping the fight until they docked. Wow. How big were these families? Well, 23 of them oh, from the one instigating family were on this cruise together. Okay. So okay. once they were docked, six men from that family and three younger teenagers were all removed for starting the fight. Um, another 14 passengers, basically the rest of their family, left by choice. I've not been able to see if any charges were ever pressed against anyone on the cruise ship involved in the fight. I think it was just too much to track down and figure out. But I do know that Carnival was put on blast and a full-blown internal investigation was done on how they handled the situation, the fact that their employees clearly were not prepared 
for anything like that. And then they were in the fight as well. They were <laughs> just like wielding broken bottles. That's crazy. That's crazy. Wow. Wow. Definitely another cruise I don't want to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think that was a good a good step into a little less serious. And mm -hmm. I'm going to take another step okay. by asking a, a, a question I've been wondering about for years, Danielle. Okay. Uh, do princesses poop? I don't know. I might have to ask Raylan, my daughter. <laughs> no, no. I, well, I, I, you know, I... I guess you could be thinking about Disney princesses, but uh, I'm thinking about a different kind. And actually, these kind, they can. Huh, interesting. In, in 2016, Princess Cruise Lines was fined $40 million after a ship was busted pooping in the ocean. And an investigation showed it wasn't the only boat doing this. Four other princesses pooped. That's a lot of pooping princesses. It is. Apparently... There are monitoring systems for the waste on these ships and yeah. clever engineers figured out how to trick those systems and release the waste directly into the ocean using what they call a magic pipe. Now, one single princess poop can be more than 4,000 gallons of waste. I'm so disturbed. Danielle, and you wonder why I don't eat fish. John, I ate tuna for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I am so upset right now. <laughs> why were they doing that? I, 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 the, I, the only thing I could think of is the charge for disposing of it later or something yeah. about the process of disposing of it. Maybe it takes too long to get the boat turned around or something. I don't know. Why would you do this? 4,000 gallons of waste just for one of those instances. And you know what I wonder? I wonder if anyone on the ship was like, oh, <laughs> something yeah. like smells funny yeah, out here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't look over the edge right now. It's looking a little strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm so disturbed. I already knew this whole episode was going to upset me, but oh my goodness. I, I think the princess poops actually may have destroyed <laughs> cruises forever. Just sent you over the edge. I'm over the edge with the princess poop. The princess poop is a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot to handle. I'm sure they do it at night so that you can't see over the, you know, probably limit how many people are aware of, of what's going on there. You yeah. know, I watch like, um, I watch below deck and, yeah. and, and shows like that. And, I, I don't think they're doing princess poops necessarily, but yeah. you'll see there's all kinds of like bilge and stuff. Like when those boats are moving around, there's tons of different materials that are just coming out of the bottom of them. I, I don't know what those are in every instance, but uh, in these particular instances, we, we do know what it was. Yeah, it was Woo! disgusting, you know, and another thing as well. So for those that don't know, I used to be in cosmetology and one of my goals, if I wasn't able to be in New York and I wanted to do hair for like the runway and shows and things is I wanted to do hair on a cruise. Cause I was like, Oh, how fun is that? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Are you kidding <laughs> me? Get people all gussied up for their big night out and they're and celebrating like, things and, and yeah. be able to travel. Oh yeah. my goodness. Can I just thank my lucky stars that that never happened? <laughs> I'm upset. <laughs> I am like very upset at the moment. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. Well, that was a doozy of an episode. It was. And, and I am so interested to know who's going to win this month. This is like one of those times where I just think we should both say we both won. <laughs> like that was an exhausting episode to go through, but it's not up to us. It is up to you guys to vote who told the best cruise ship crime story. And you can do that voting over at our Twitter account at Crime After Pod, where you can vote for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We always have a link in the description box below, or you can also click the little letter I up in the corner and it will take you there as well. At Crime After Crime Podcast, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to give us more likes. Hint, hint. 
How to <laughs> More suggest, <shameless> promo. <laughs> <laughs> how to just suggest show topics, join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge thank you to our patrons. Patrons get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. For those of you who are our patrons, look forward to the next upcoming episode. And to make everyone else who's not jealous, you find out what kitchen appliance I would be. <laughs> and if I were a potato, what kind of potato I'd be. So you guys are Ooh. really missing out over there. <laughs> yeah, it's high stakes over in the Patreon special. <laughs> exactly. And <laughs> if you become a patron, you get a personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. Absolutely. Join us in a month when we're going to be back with our next episode. Danielle and I are going to be looking into faked deaths. Do, 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 do. Ooh, that's going <laughs> to be good. interesting. It is. I am kind of worried. You're, you're a little worried? People, well, people that are going to go to the extent of faking their deaths, like, I feel like that kind of scares me. I'm kind of scared of that kind of person. It's interesting. And what type of crime are they yeah. trying to get away from or situation? Yeah. Yeah. No, I thank you. I don't know what's going to happen, Daniel. This show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime and give them a like. Give them a like. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And we will see you on our next episode. Bye bye. Bye.